are you? Very good, I think. How, how does it, um, I mean, I wanted to start by asking how, it's, how it feels to be back in London because this is kind of where it started for you. This is where you're... This is, yeah, this is where I started also at the BFI because this is the only place where you'd come to see movies. This <laughs> yeah. is the academy that used to be on Oxford Street. Yeah. So we're here all the time. Do you have fond memories of your time studying film here? Uh, I have fabulous memories about film school. Yeah. And uh, at uh, Grand London Film School, we were first on Charlotte Street, and then, well, I was there for two years. We moved to moved to Covent Garden, where it is now, I think. And then, um, and then we we lived here for six years. My first daughter was born in Wimbledon, and so we're uh, sort of always back in London many years. But yeah, it, it resonates. I mean, it's uh, particularly Soho, which has changed quite a bit, but it's still kind of the same. Yeah, not I so I worked for 20th Century Fox for for about seven or eight months after I got out of film school in Soho Square. And so, yeah. yeah. It's not there anymore, unfortunately. I just miss that thing of seeing people running around Soho with, with reels of film right. and that kind yeah. of thing. It was, it was the hub of that kind of industry, was it? I wanted to ask if... Um, One thing I would add, though, this, this is a terrible place to be broke. <laughs> this is, I mean, it's like cold and... Yeah, yeah. You know, expensive. With, you know, sitting rooms are moldy <laughs> with little heaters that took a half crown and you got three minutes, you got three hours of heat. So, so myself, my another friend of mine used to sleep in the take turns sleeping in the bathtub in the common in the common restroom because the water heat they didn't charge it for the water heater or something. But that that's so that part was good. So it's great to be broke in Southern California, not not in there. London. No, no. What do you think started your journey to tell stories? Why did you want to tell stories? What do why you, did I want to why did you want to tell stories? Uh, it didn't really start by telling stories. It started with, um, in, in a different kind of ambition, which was to impact um, people with, with what you were thinking and, and uh, uh, experiencing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that came probably in two, two parts without me really putting it together until, much, until a little bit later, which was seeing um, uh, particularly uh, some of Murnau's films, particularly Faust and some Joyless Street and Pabst. And then uh, Dr. Strangelove came out and that was, uh, it was shortly after I saw that, uh, which, was, which was interesting because Strangelove is, is, the whole movie is a third act. Mm -hmm. You can imagine what the, there's a first and a second act, this is just the whole movie is made of the third act. It has such a, you know, intensity and immediacy to it. And the idea that you could make something that's so highly individualized, an artistic expression that's so highly integrated and individualized from one person, and at the same time, you, you're affecting masses of people. Mm -hmm. It's not some poetic little thing that 17 people will see. And, um, and it was shortly after that that occurred to, that just suddenly struck me that you, this is what you have to do. And, and, and it was, I was fortunate I got struck by this because I had been tortured for the last three years without knowing, having a clue about what I wanted to do and kept shifting around. So. Light bulb moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think you still make films for the same reasons that you started making them for? Um, no, it evolves as, as time goes by. Um, I went through, uh, the first feature film I made was very much a, uh, was very much, um, Kind of a it's, it's, it's kind of a metaphor in the sense that it's analog, which was which was thief, and um, and it was, it was to me it was very political. It was also political to French critics, but nobody it wasn't to any of the American critics. <laughs> um, kind of took off from Marx's labor theory of value. Yeah. The, you know that was the uh, and some quotes from it, and and that was surprised there was one image on the social media from the recent writer strike. Where somebody was uh, was carrying a placard that had a quote from Thief on it, which is uh, um, something about you know you profiting from the yield of my labor. So that that was the uh, that was the impetus behind Thief. So then it changes as time goes. There was a um, I, I had a realization in the 80s that it was almost to to make a film in which you think you're telling a story and that audience will connect with that story and change the way they think uh, was, was, a, was an outdated notion that the way media worked was that it had to be systemic, meaning if, uh, if a sitcom with 22 episodes a year 
had appliances in the kitchens of a certain standard, that set a value as a norm. So that expressed itself for me in a lot of ways in the first two seasons of Miami Vice, which um, in which I had my own kind of secret agenda, which is that I hated disco, so it was kind of an anti-disco <laughs> television series. How and do I, you hate disco? I hated disco. <laughs> Um, and it's kind of a me, me, I, I, I generation kind of expression. So, so um, I then had a, uh, I uh, changed the character that Eddie almost played and it cast Eddie almost as, as kind of my ideological Jesuit with a lowercase j to, to uh, talk about accountability and responsibility and kind of a harder, more, um, if you like, neo rock and roll perspective. And so that was the... Can I ask you one Miami Vice geeky question, please? Yeah. Um, and it's music related. Were you responsible for the Phil Collins in the air tonight? Is it responsible for the... You know, the Phil Collins in the air tonight scene, because that's something that you do in, your, in all your films in the way that music does this fantastic thing of building texture and mood mm -hmm. and kind of tells you so much the, about stories. Yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was originally called uh, Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And then I changed the title to Miami Vice. Tony Yerkovich wrote a fantastic two-hour teleplay, which was a pilot. Mm -hmm. I didn't create it, Tony did. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and I went down to Miami, and the whole of Miami was as if somebody came out, a giant hand came out of the sky and painted everything tan. The whole city was beige. <laughs> and they were starting to tear down all these wonderful streamlined deco hotels on, on, on South Beach. And I wanted to find out what they had looked like originally, mm. and um, and I did through some, through some research, and then went to a, a paint store with my wife, who's a painter, and started looking through paint chips to get an idea of the color palette, and uh, and with, particularly with pastels that things were originally painted, and vi certain vibration between different pastels, and that then became the um, you know the. Uh, that then became the, you know, the look of that show. Yeah. The, um, that plus very radical uh, casting and probably, oh, I'd say maybe a third of the teleplays, for, meaning a third of the episodes of the first two, first two years were, uh, were, I think, very significant, um, you know, uh, content-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, we did something on, we did something where the CIA was financing um, Loads of weapons to uh, try and charter planes to South Amer to Central America and bringing back cocaine and yeah. had G. Gordon Liddy play the CIA agent and um, and the, it aired on a Friday night on the following Sunday Hassenfuss got shot down which then resulted in Contragate so we wow. were, so that was which was about the same subject but uh, there are a lot of but we, and we did 22 a year which is quite a few oh I yeah. loved. Anyone else in the room love Miami Vice? So great, loved it. Um, we've got the kind of the, the slightly annoying thing about tonight is that we can't show clips of all your films, which I would have so loved, but we're gonna show our first clip and our first clip is Heat. Yeah, I know, what a way to start, eh? Absolutely. Yeah. What do you, before we, we show this clip, what do you, when you think about that film and you think about that time in your career, what's the kind of first well, thing? Uh, for me, the, for me, the the excitement about doing Heat was first of all I heard the story of the uh, uh, a friend of mine, Charlie Adamson, was a detective in Chicago. He killed the real uh, Neil Macaulay in 1963, and how he regarded Macaulay struck me in a very particular way, uh, which is that he had tremendous respect for this guy, and he had he had bumped into him, you know, almost got into a shootout in the parking lot outside the Belden Deli in Chicago. And then uh, Charlie said, come on, I'll buy a cup of coffee, and sat down and he had a conversation with him. It wasn't exactly the conversation I wrote, but the point was Charlie talked about him as uh, he respected his professionalism, how disciplined he was. Um, uh, he really had a sense of a three-dimensional, complete humanity mm -hmm. that I already had known from, uh, from other work and other research I did that uh, to, um, you know, with particular John Santucci, who's the thief that Thief is based on, the um, uh, every, everybody's life is as complex as each one of yours. 
everybody has a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a child, and all those considerations and all those domestic dramas, the contradictions that they carry, that they have in their lives with their partners, not with their partners, but within themselves, and they don't get resolved, they only get resolved in movies. In real life, we carry these contradictions and this storm of oppositional things to the grave. So, you know, therefore, I wanted my characters, particularly in, in, in Thief, but then also in, um, in, in Heat, to have all that dimensionality. And I, I, I always liked Ford Maddox for The Good Soldier. And so with that kind of re revolving narrative perspective, mm -hmm. I, the ambition was is that when you're with a character, his universe is your universe. You empathize with it totally. His value system is your value system. And that meant that when we're with Hannah, the Al Pacino character, or with uh, Bobby, with the um, uh, Neil McCauley character, yeah. or with, with um, Krisha Hurlis, Val That's Kilmer, good, yeah. uh, that we see the world the way they do. And then further, that what if what if the way causality works is a function of the way they think the world works? So that, those are the conceits that then, you know, were, were uh, built into that structure of that screenplay, um, which meant that at the end there would be this kind of dialectic where you hopefully was able to pull it off that you were empathizing with De Niro 100%. You want him to escape. You don't want him to make the mistake he makes. And then you're empathizing, you want him to get away, and you're with, uh, you know, Hannah and his, and his avid pursuit, because all I am is who I'm going after, his avid pursuit of Neil McCauley, because he's a hunter, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and which would produce a uh, kind of a fugue-type ending of counterpoint at the end. And, um, and then the irony that McCauley's dying and he takes the hand of the only other person in, in, in their universe who understand, who's the same as he is. Because uh, their sameness is that they're fully conscious. That's the only sameness. So there was the ambition of the drama well, well as I was writing the screenplay. So that was the... It's that, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll watch this scene yeah. in, in a second. And it's, every time, even, I mean, I watched all the, so many films leading up to doing this and watching Heat again was just such a joy. And this moment, again, I've seen it so many times, but it just still makes me cry every time I watch it. You really kind of feel this connection that these two characters have and that moment that you right. see of kind of taking yeah. the hand. So let's just take a look at, at this clip, our first clip from Heat.
Yes. Yeah. What's the reality of of shooting that and, and and writing that 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 ending? You know, in terms of the the location, the logistics, and how you build that tension. We're shooting at LAX. It was the same weekend that the Unabomber was threatening to blow up the airport. And he had a fabulous location manager who managed to talk the airport authority into still letting us actually shoot no. there. And so the, um, it was, it was um, and these planes were coming over about 300 feet over our heads, and, and you, you, the noise and the intensity of it was so intense that you could stand there and think that you were actually working. You weren't really working, you were just sitting and enduring, but we, um, but that's the, um, anyway. That idea, though, of the kind of, the music that comes in there as well, yeah. that uh, Elliot, who did the, the score for, 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 for right. you, uh, is just extraordinary. And it's almost kind of like a, a love theme at the very end, you know, when, when, when we see... Um, well, that's the idea. I mean, the idea I had, I, 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 uh, I believe that films are best constructed from the end to the front. And so I can't really know, uh, like, I don't believe I can go on a voyage unless I know the destination. Yeah. And I have to absolutely have clear in my own mind exactly what it is. And it's that uh, these two men, uh, the dying Neil McCauley is fortunate enough to have the only other person in the world who's the closest to him right with him as he's leaving existence. And the, uh, despite the fact that that is also the person that just shot him. And uh, that was the ending. And so when I had the ending, then, then in, the, in the process of writing, that's when I actually could complete the whole screenplay because I could reverse engineer that into, if this is the ending, then what's the end of Act 3? If that's the end of Act 3, what's the ending of Act 2? And that's, that, that was how the screenplay was constructed. Is that how you've always written then? And, and how and where did that start? Uh, yeah, I learned early on that it's not a good idea to start at the beginning. <laughs> because by about page 7, you're off on a tangent, then there's a tangent off the tangent, and then you're totally lost by about page 9. <laughs> and I wrote a screenplay like that and turned it in very early on in my, my career. And, and uh, somebody said, you have a good ear for dialogue, but you wouldn't know what a story was if it ran you over. <laughs> <laughs> so, and a guy named Bob Lewin, who, uh, who was kind enough to then take me through story construction, which is, which is, which is quite architectural, mm -hmm. meaning I could take a screenplay, it's almost as if you could put it in an MRI and you get the skeleton, if the skeleton is has got to be absolutely right for me. So the structure is, is, is key. So. When you come to creating something that is based around real events, though, like Ali, for example, right. so you have the kind of framework of a real person, real events that happened, right. and you've got to navigate which of those and, and the story that you want to tell within that time frame that you want to feature right. within that story. What was the what was the journey of that in terms of well, what end point did you the know? The journey of that is absolutely fantastic, which is to be with Muhammad Ali for every, you know, two, three days a week, wow. all the way through uh, some of the writing and then the pre-production, and then he was there during all the shooting we did in the United States. And it was, it was incredible. Um, he was, he got to approve the director, she had to approve me, which she did. And um, the uh, and the first thing he said was was uh, I'm not interested in hate geography. I w I'm proud of the mistakes I made, mm -hmm. um, and and the tri and the trials and tribulations I had to discover what I discovered about myself. He wanted everything in warts and all. He didn't want some glowing, you know. And um, uh, I asked him. What, at one point, what was he most ashamed of and uh, troubled by? And it was, he said it was his rejection of Malcolm X in front of the hotel in Accra. And uh, he regretted that because he never saw Malcolm again because Malcolm got assassinated. And um, uh, in Miami, I introduced him to Malcolm's daughter who looked exactly like Malcolm, reddish hair, light skin. And, uh, and they you know, spent about an hour or so together. And she was very helpful to us and, um, uh, in a number of aspects of the film. But the, um, when we were doing Miami Vice, doing the pilot, we'd done some, a lot of location scouting and shot some video. And I happened to have shot the Fifth Street Gym in Miami, which is then was, had been torn down by the time we came to shoot the film. But we were able to, we found the video and we were able to, uh, reconstruct exactly what the Fifth Street gym looked like. And one of his favorite things that he had was, was, was a bus that he had that he would drive from Louisville to, or Louisville, as he said, Louisville to New York. And 
So we were recreating um, parts of its history with, with uh, in, in actuality. There really was a location. The, the chip paint on the windows of Fifth Street Gym, everything was exactly as it was. And it was as if he could walk into a set and it was like time travel. And then we had, he was there, uh, Howard Bingham, who was a late Howard Bingham, who was also a close friend, was there, um, and uh, uh, Ron Silver, who, who um, played the trainer, whose name I'm blanking on, was there along, along with the trainer. So we, it, it was, there's pictures of these people there, and there's the real people, and there's Will and everything. And then um, it's extraordinary, Will turned himself into a boxer, so he, prepped for about nine to 10 months. Um, he worked probably four or five hours a day, five days a week to become a boxer. And then and it took uh, probably about eight months, or nine months until he could, uh, he could successfully uh, do a version of Ali's um, agility and footwork particularly, because Ali was, was perfectly proportioned. You could see Ali, you wouldn't know if he was 5'8", or 6'4". He was just perfectly proportioned. Will is it? Will's trunk is longer than his legs and his <laughs> hips are wider. So that, so to get the footwork right and to get the faint, faint to get everything right. Because yeah. we did, we gave up, uh, we boxed, that was it. We gave up, I mean, Michael Bent was not, as, as Sonny Liston was not trying to knock out Will Smith, but so sometimes some of these blows connected. So the, the blows were light, but we, we just, we gave up anything phony about padded gloves and anything, just one. In the, Go it, real. Yeah. You know, what, what's the kind of preparation and the choreography around shooting things like that, like you know, like fights and in the ring, and you know, for you to have your, because I know that I saw on your. We did a, we did a very, uh, we did a very precise analysis. I did a very precise analysis of each of, a, of the fight. Mm -hmm. I, I viewed the fight as a story. Yeah. And that each round was kind of an act of the story. You know, if it's a, if it's a three minute uh, round, what are the salient points of that round? Um, He's dodging Liston, he's wary of Liston in the beginning, and then right at the end of the first round, he sees Liston coming and he throws this left hand jab that connects with Liston's forehead, and then all of a sudden, Liston has a realization of how hard this guy can hit, and, he, and it stuns him. And so that's that surprise to Liston, that's the story of round one. And so then, the, if there was, there, there may have been three or four pieces that we absolutely choreographed exactly the way they happened, and then everything in between was improvisational. So that's how, that's how it was all approached. The other thing about it that was really interesting was, was Ali, um, the, the Nation of Islam newspaper was called Muhammad Speaks. The editor was, had actually worked at, worked at Playboy, which is a very progressive publication in Chicago when, when, when it began. And then he's African American, and then he left and, and went to edit Muhammad Speaks, and he was very political. And in the 60s, he was attuned to third world National Liberation Front movements. So when you read Muhammad Speaks, there's something about so-and-so opened up a haberdashery on 59th Street. And when you got to page four, there'd be something about the, you know, the struggles in Angola and Mozambique and uh, you know, Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. So Ali was very up to, was very current. Mm -hmm. With, uh, with, with third world political struggles uh, throughout the 1960s. So the position he took about against the uh, war in Vietnam was not, obviously not a surprise. And um, uh, he, was, he was very, very too. So it was, um, he was, um, he was a fascinating guy. I could go on for a long time talking about him. He particularly, uh, when he had Parkinson's um, and had trouble speaking, mm -hmm. Most people he encountered assumed that because he had trouble speaking, they imputed that he was mentally deficient. And of course he wasn't. Now most people endure that, and then they actually start to think they are mentally deficient, and they start to get depressed. Ali never did. Um, and it's, uh, it was, anyway, he's an amazing guy. How amazing to get so much, spend so much time with him. We've got a, a clip from Ali okay. that we're gonna show now.
money, then you bet it on Sonny. He know I'm great, he will fall in eight. Come on, you big ugly bear, I'll whoop you right now. It's an attempt to try and bring audiences into African-American culture in the 60s as it was mm. then with segregation, with, uh, uh, with, with, with the contradictions uh, of, of Ali, whose father was a sign painter, painting a white Jesus in a black church, and, and that, mm. uh, and uh, particularly integra well integrated piece of, um, piece of writing that Eric Roth and I did, and uh, you know. Anyway. And the way that you, you intercut that scene as well with the Sam Cooke performance in the club, you know, when Sam's yeah, performing yeah. and the way that it kind of cuts between those two kind of scenarios right, as yeah, well. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's those kind of, these parallel stories. Right, it's that are, of, yeah. Yeah. People sometimes ask me, what are your favorite film? I don't know that I have favorite films, but I definitely have favorite pieces of film, so that's <laughs> one of the favorite pieces of the films. Yeah. Technology, something that you're always really, uh, kind of seem ahead of the game on as well, in terms of when that yeah. shift went from di to digital, when digital felt like it was becoming right. the yeah. kind of the, something that was gonna really change the opportunities or, or the texture or the landscape for film. You, you kind of jumped on board and Collateral was, was one of those films that you, yeah. that you started. It, 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 yeah, to me, I mean, to me, you're trying to, constantly trying to find new modes of expression, mm -hmm. more intense modes of expression to impact the audience more, more forcefully, powerfully, and, and engage them more thoroughly. And so media itself is always constantly evolving, and of course the cutting edge of that is gonna be the technology, just like it is in architecture. And um, you know, what, you suddenly you could do different things. And, um, and for Collateral, it was the uh, desire to, to, the whole movie takes place in 12 hours and one night in Los Angeles, and it was to evoke what night looks like in Los Angeles, which is unique. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon in London. <laughs> we, at a certain time, a certain, I mean, it gets dark early. At a certain time of year, because a marine layer comes in, it's about, at about 1,200 feet, and, it, and in that period, all the sodium vapor lamps reflected off the bottom of the clouds, and there was this incandescent kind of yellow glow the city and you could see forever. It was like late afternoon. And um, so, and there was no way to do that on photochemical film. The only way to do that was in, with video. And when I experimented with some video in Ali, is a rooftop, in the opening, in fact, when he's running on the street on the way to the gym, he gets stopped by these cops. Um, and, uh, and so we were on, very much on a, uh, on a, on a kind of a radical forefront because it had it was the photo first photo reel film shot on on, on on high def on video or low def which it was so we were using a Sony F900 camera and uh, and that so we were able to see you're able to see particularly in the scenes in the cab you were able to see you know the streets deep at night sequence with the coyotes for example yeah and um, oh, and I had a nightmare. The, we, when we were doing the R and D, we would we, we, we took three months, and we were you know we'd get some we we shoot some stuff, send it to E film, they'd shoot it onto regular motion picture film, photochemical, and we'd look at it. And today it's magenta. We take the same piece, send it back the next day, and it's cyan. So, <laughs> so uh, there there was we had to rework some of the logarithms at E film to do all of this. I had a nightmare about three weeks in that that uh, the film didn't exist at all that I, you know, this is all some form of sick, you know, conceptual arts that only exists in my memory. There's nothing physical to show anybody. And, uh, you know, it turns out that that wasn't the case, but that was the... It, but it's when you, you know, we watch a clip right now and the, the aesthetic of this film is so, is, 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 a, is a character almost in the film, you know, those colors right. in, in the film that, that we, that we kind of, they're, they're, they really set an atmosphere, they really set a mood, they really set a tone. Um, the casting in this as well, I remember kind of, it was, there was so much said about the fact that you'd cast in Tom Cruise in this and it being something that right. he'd, you know, a role or a type of role that he'd never done before. And watching the film back and seeing Tom and Jamie, and you can't think of any other two people taking on these roles, it's just fantastic. Do you remember that process of casting Tom and why he was the right person for um, this role? 
Yeah, I had I had always liked Tom, and I, I wanted to see Tom do that yeah. kind of. I've known him for a long time, and I wanted him to see. I wanted to see him do that kind of a part. There's an obvious uh, similarity or homage, if you like, to Lee Marvin, to point blank, in terms of that kind of a, a character is monochromatic and gray for a reason. Of if he commits a crime and there's a witness and they're trying to describe him. Well, he was middle-aged, he kind of wore a gray suit, had gray hair. So he's, just as non he's making himself as anonymous as possible in his, in his appearance as, as uh, you know, kind of tradecraft. Um, and, uh, and, and Jamie is an old uh, friend. And the, the, going back to Ali, one of the most difficult parts of Ali is that when I had Jamie in the ring in between, this is between takes, I had Jamie in the ring, I had Will in the ring, and, and, and then um, uh, John Voigt as Howard Cosell was in Howard Cosell mode as soon as he put the makeup on and cracking jokes. And all three of them would do stand up and I'd have about 200 extras are all having a great time. And you couldn't get anything done. So this was the, uh, <laughs> so. You gonna call her? Oh, you know, your lady friend, the one who gave you a business card. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. What? Pick up the phone. Life's short. One day, it's gone. You and I make it out of this alive, you should call her. That's what I think. Audio slave track. Why that? I mean, in terms of you know, I mentioned earlier about the that you, with the use of music, both needle drops and the way you right. you you've got such a great relationship with how you've used music in your films, and that's a great example of that song is telling us stuff. It feels it feels part of the narrative. Talk to me about that choice and and why that. Uh, audio slave. Um, there is there is no logic i mean there's no there's no um just like the song there's no rational i mean i hear a piece of music and it it evokes something a poetic impulse in me that captures the mood of it and combined with the way coyotes behave in in, uh, in los angeles and the surrealism and uh, the two guys that have a certain moment just sinking into a uh, very introspective searching within themselves at a moment of introspection and um 
we know what this side of the with a, with a girl on top of the the cab kind of looks like Jada, so um, who Jamie's character had contact with before, and um, you know this is a moment of introspection. And if I can bring audience into the inside, you know, the into connection with the inner life going on within characters, that's what that's what this does for me. So that's um, that's what it comes from. What was it? Um it, filming in those car scenes, in particular in Collateral, in the car with, with Tom right. with, and Jamie, in terms of, talk to me a little bit about that experience and how how that worked, because it's kind of, you know, even in that shot, we see that kind of pool of focus between the two in that conversation. It's kind of... Well, what I was saying, what I was saying about the, the video, when you see past, past Tom's profile and you're seeing the trees against the sky, you can't see that. In in, uh, in 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 photochemical, the you'd have to be working at such a wide open f-stop that there'd be such a shallow depth of field that you wouldn't have any of that any of that uh, any of that perspective. And L.A. particularly in that period was alive with like sig helicopters in the sky and almost like signal traffic, if you like. And there's a certain kind of dusty surrealism to the city. It's not that way anymore. You you uh, the, the Los Angeles of, of collateral. Um, is in fact about 20 years ago, and um, uh, right now there's a lot of new construction. And, and uh, did that journey with digital continue? Was the idea then you had such a great opportunity with what you did with that film that that's how you wanted to take that forward? Because right. with, with with Public Enemies, it was you know you had the choice. Well, is it am I going to shoot this on digital? Am I going to shoot this on film? What was the reason and the choice for that being shot on digital? Um, how do how, I ask myself the question? How do I want you to perceive uh, 1933? Yeah. And uh, and I decided not as um, not as something period, not as um, because if, because it, it can be quite beautiful mm -hmm. and um, and kind of fluid. I love that about film. But if I rendered it that way, it would be an object you're looking at which kind of removes the audience, moves the audience backwards into observers, as opposed to I am here in, I want to bring them into the movie, I'm here in 1933, this is happening, this is current, yeah. make it feel current. And both with Collateral and with, with Public Enemies, it was released on photochemicals, which was, which was not good because release prints are notorious. Filmmakers know release prints are notoriously bad. That was, that was why I hide that. And then uh, also to work towards a, a, a really fine saturation. Yeah. And the, the clip you're going to see is interesting. I had, uh, this is the Bo Little Bohemia, it's a lodge in upstate Wisconsin. And I had, uh, we're looking for locations for it. And I said, by the way, why don't you call and find out if some remnant of it's still there? And we made a, we made a call. And it turned out that the whole lodge was absolutely still there, where these events really happened. And um, we talked talked to the guy who owned it and said, yeah, in fact, he left a suitcase. I said, who left the suitcase? Dillinger left a suitcase. Oh my God. And I said, well, was there anything in it? Oh, yes, yeah, his clothes. And everything else. <laughs> so, so we shot this exactly where it happened. And the, the, um, the, the resonance for Depp and all of us to actually be in the actual bedroom Dillinger was in. When he put his hand on the doorknob, there was the same doorknob that, because nothing had changed, the plumbing fixtures hadn't changed, nothing changed. They even had some of the bullet holes in the wall. And it was the same doorknob that Don Dillinger put his hand on, and the escape route was the best escape route, that's why Dillinger chose it, and we did the same thing. And the, uh, so everything about it is not only factual, I would have changed it if, if, if it was, if, if factual, was boring or just interesting. Not only factual, but it's actually exactly where it occurred. And it's. Um, Let's, should we have a look at it? Take a look at Let's it. have a look at it. Stop that claw! You investigation! Stop that claw!
immersive. The choice of kind of handheld and the kind of, it's so immersive. You feel like you're, how do you, I mean, it's such a lame question, but how do you shoot something like that? You know, in terms of it's, it's, it, there's so much going on. There's, it, it feels like, you know, it's, it's, it's actually happening. But in terms of the preparation and going in to shoot something like that, and the choreography that's involved, uh, and the well, well, yeah, we, you just was, you just used the word choreography, which is exactly the answer. It's all about the choreography and choreography. We were we were in um, we were in Puerto Mozambique on our late, and um, uh, we happened upon which which it, it, I don't know what it's like now, but at the time it was really a, 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 a decayed uh, urban environment. And uh, when the Portuguese left in 74, they trashed everything that they could in terms of the civil engineering. And uh, we came on this ruin of a church, and it was a local neighborhood dance company. And we just, we just went on location, scout 15 people. We walked, just walked in, because we heard this music. And here's about 30 Mozambicans dancing with a choreographer. I have no idea exactly, you know, what, what, and, and um, we knew exactly, I could tell exactly what the, sto what the story was. And through an interpreter, I asked the Portuguese-speaking choreographer, I said, this is what I think is happening in the dance. They said, yeah, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned from talking to him that at the heart of choreography is a story. And the same as if it's, a, as if it's dialogue. So this is really, so I analyze and I break down, analyze, and plan these things, scenes like this, as uh, it's all a story, um, a purpose, who is a talented amateur, because um, uh, the FBI was populated by accountants and lawyers, according to Jerry Hoover's idea of having the best people in this Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is all brand new, except they weren't any good when they hit the street and actually got into physical combat. So then they hired people like Steve White, played by, um, by Steve Lang, who were, who were not the appropriate type for the FBI, but actually could could, we were good in urban combat, ex-Texas Ranger. And um, so he makes, a, he makes a mistake. He assumes that these three innocent people driving out of there are, um, are, are part of the Dillinger's gang. The gunfire happens, these people get, these people get killed. And uh, it all erupted too early. He was too eager to, to, to move in. Dillinger escapes. Um, so all of that it was, so we wanted chaos engendered by bad decision making, and that's the uh, that influence that creates the design of what's of what's what's happening here. And then it's then it's the pieces, you know. The uh, this is the room it actually happened in. He was asleep when it happened when uh, when the gunfire erupted. And I'm assuming there's not much of it left after that was shot. So not much of it. Not much of the, the building left after you shot that as well. That's so it's well, gone. Well, we actually <laughs> covered the walls with our own walls, and then uh, it's still there. So. The, the, by the way, one thing I'd mentioned is that the, when the suitcase arrived, Dylan's suitcase, that meant that Johnny Depp could, um, we opened it up, and, and there were some ties, some underwear, some socks, and when a man goes into a store and buys something, or a woman goes into a store and buys something, it, what they choose is an expression of who they are. And for the simple reason that they chose it, they liked it, it tells you what they liked. So for John, for us to actually see these, uh, you know, solid tie with a very small pattern, and then socks that were solid, except they also had one very small pattern, and it told you something about the precision of his mind, because he liked that design. So you learn things about who Dillinger, who Dillinger was, because he was, he was very bright. He'd been locked. In, he'd been in prison for 11 years. He he got out within seven or eight weeks without the advantage of modern communi telecommunications or anything, he had no idea what was going on in the world. He's living on Surf Avenue in Chicago, which, which is the most desirable neighborhood to be in at that particular time. And he, he managed to just uh, be quite brilliant mm. about all the uh, tactical uh, innovations that he did in, in exploiting the fact there was no law against interstate. There was no interstate uh, you couldn't prosecute anybody for, for interstate flight, so you could rob a bank in Wisconsin, flee to Illinois, and you were home free. That and the, and the use of automobile. The automobile was brand new. The Lincoln Highway was brand new. A reliable V8 was brand new, and so he was constantly on the move. So his tactics were, were, were quite terrific. He had never figured out what an endgame was. 
like what you know. So, um, but getting to to understand you know the man, the personality it was uh, invaluable. Ferrari is your new film. Yeah. Um, this has been a twenty-year relationship. Twenty-five, with 25 yeah. years. What started that that interest in in him? The um, what. I started myself, Sidney Pollack and Troy Kenny Martin, the writer, who did a brilliant job of of capturing this gold at, uh, of, of the heart of, of Ferrari. Um, uh, began this in, in, about, in the middle 90s, and um, it went through various incarnations and revisions. But the the central heart of it is all uh, is all to the credit of, of Troy, and. The, um, it wasn't because of the cars or, or of, in fact, even Enzo Ferrari, it was the fact that these operatic, tumultuous, melodramatic events all really occurred in the lives of these people within three months of 1957. The, um, he had, he was a, um, talking about contradictions, there was the, the, the real answer is that their lives resonated with the edginess, the asymmetry, the chaos that all life does, I think. And as I said before, it's like the, the neat resolution of conflicts only happens in movies. It doesn't happen in our lives. So there managed to be a story here with a beginning, a middle, and an end that totally, totally concluded um, with a certain, I won't say what it is, but a certain acknowledgment that Ferrari makes. and. Uh, uh, and that, but the irresolution, the asymmetry of it all stays intact. He basically has two families and has just lost his son Dino a year earlier. He and Lara have been together since the 1920s and uh, she's locked in a state of grief but is a vivacious, strong, powerful, powerful woman. And um, uh, she's imprisoned in her mourning. Enzo is in his own silo of grief. Um, and he instead is moving to the new, the next, you know, oh, the present and the future. Mm -hmm. Ask what's your favorite car, he says the next one. Um, and that's the, uh, that, the company's going broke because all he cares about is the race team. He began as a race car driver and he has that, that addictive mentality to the ecstasy of it still. And um, uh, at the same time, Lara, who owns half the company, which he, Nietzsche to sign her shares over is um, uh, discovers the second family and his illegitimate son Piero, who I've known for about 25 years, and and uh, she calls it co piloti He had a co-driver. That's why he didn't pay attention as Dino was dying, and you're responsible for his death. So this is so it is a very operatic um, uh, story. Appropriately, uh, uh, Modena is also where Pavarotti comes from. The Storky Opera House was next door to the Ferrari House. Um, he owned like two football teams, right. and he had he ran two. He had he owned two football teams. He had the Ferrari. He's this incredible character. We've got right. a couple of clips that we're going to okay. show now, and then um, thank you for bringing these, by the way. And then we'll chat some more. Yeah. Oh. For his death? Yes! Yes, because you promised me he wouldn't die! Everything! I did everything! Table showing what calories he could eat, what went in, what came out. I grafted the degrees of albuminuria, the degrees of azotemia, diuresis. I know more about nephritis and dystrophy than cars! 
Yes, I blame you, I blame you. Could you let him die? The father deluded himself. The great engineer. I will restore my son to health. Swiss doctors, Italian doctors, bullshit. I could not. I did not. Because you were so consoled at Castelvetro, you lost your attention. You had another boy growing stronger while Dino was getting weaker. What goes on in your mind? He got sick. Dystrophy. Kidneys. They destroyed him. It destroyed us. What do you care? Huh? You have another son. You have another wife. She's not my wife. But he is my son. Thank you. So excited for you guys to yeah. see this film. It's it's there's so much going on. There's so much intimacy, but then you also have these big pieces like the car race is extraordinary, oh. and I, I believe that you you had you know you designed certain camera um, uh, tripod type things to to actually have them in the cars so that you could feel like we were in the cars with the drivers. I mean, it is so. Uh, an extraordinary kind of piece of filmmaking, just the car race element to itself. Why was that important for you to, 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 for it to be that way? That's a great question, because you're also in it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, that's exactly right. It's it, the, the, again, uh, I wanted, uh, a director would ask himself, how do I want the racing to be experienced mm -hmm. by the audience? and. Uh, to me, I didn't want the external observation, long lens, beautiful cars winding down roads. I wanted to put, I wanted the exact, in, the exact opposite of that. I wanted or kind of the inverse. I wanted the, uh, as much as possible, the experience of, of being in the car, driving the car and putting you, putting you in that position, which means a whole bunch of things. It's, it's the, uh, you're never tracking when you're racing or driving with what the car is doing right now. You're always, you have a Zen focus into the next thing that's happening. So that, that complete uh, elimination, of the, uh, elimination of the world, except what you're focused on, is part of what drops you into this kind of meditative state sometimes when everything is working right. And so you're not clocking the agitation that's happening uh, it's happening. It's happening currently, and the cars made in that period. The Ferraris were the most you know, technologically advanced, but technology in 1957 was that the the cars were very powerful, but they didn't have obviously safety features. They didn't have they didn't have nice. braking. The tires are about this wide, which meant that the control had to be absolutely perfect, or the car got away from you and really took off on its own. Um, and the, uh, there is an accident in the film in which Costalotti, um, a good driver, gets, gets killed. The uh, driver who had just set a record on the, on the autodrome of the local track driving a Maserati, the, the Ferrari competitor, um, was leaving the track as Costalotti came to try and regain the record and he stopped at something called the Strangolini chicane and watched Costalotti come through and miss a downshift from fourth to third and then catapult into the air as a result of it and get killed. And he wrote a paragraph about it in French. He was a very plain speaking man and he talked about the ridiculousness of, of our, our addiction to this ecstasy. Mm. And, um, and typically you would see your friend get killed perhaps on like the, the mortality rate was high. On Sunday, you say, that's it, I'm never driving again. By Wednesday, you're back testing, and by the next Sunday, you're back behind the wheel. And so that was the nature of it, and that's very much the heart mm. of what's an Enzo. He raced, uh, he decided he wanted to be a, a race car driver um, in, in probably about, 19, about 1918, and um, that he did in the 1920s, and then he ran the Alfa Romeo race team. So that's what was in his blood, and he made enough passenger cars to finance the racing, that's what it's all about. Um, I'm glad the film took this long to be made because Adam Driver as Enzo and Penelope Cruz in yeah. particular as Laura are extraordinary. They're the fire. They're both she extraordinary. Oh my so God, she, yeah. Shailene, that's a flashback Shailene, yeah. you're saying to the bombed out ruins of the factory in 1945 when, uh, when Shailene is pregnant. And yeah. Um, the input, input behind it, uh, Lowell Bergman 
uh, played by Al Pacino, it was an old friend of mine, and uh, we, were, uh, we were developing a story about a uh, arm smuggler, an Armenian arm smuggler who was living in Palm Beach. And um, You have some great friends. <laughs> I love this. So I knew, oh and my God, everything comes from something you know. They all come from people or stories. all come from people yeah. I know. I, yeah. know. I know a lot of interesting people. Yeah. And, the, uh, uh, and meanwhile, he was going through the events of Insider, and, uh, and I was one of maybe about 10 people he talked to and say, uh, you'll never guess what happened to me today. Don Hewitt walks by like he didn't know me. I've known him for 15 years. And, and when the abridged version aired, uh, I was talking to Lowell about it, you know, right after it aired, and, I, and we'd seen it, and then it just occurred to me, I said, you know, forget Sarkis, Sarkisian, the, Ar the Armenian arms merchant, what you're living through is the film we ought to do right now, you know, it, it was such a contradiction because he didn't like Wygant, and he was committing his job and his profession to support to stay in solidarity with Wygand, and Wygand was a flawed character which made it worth doing. If he had been some kind of perfect embodiment of various character traits, he would, have been, you know, would not have been interested in this. But what Lowell was, in the, and I think what the challenge was for me was, was how in real life litigation could drive somebody like Wygand to contemplate suicide, destroy his family because he's attacking your children, attacking your, 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 your medical, your ability to pay for your kids' education. I mean, r really nasty, big time corporate litigation like that. And so the, the challenge became, can this become suspenseful? Because in, and the mark, it, the threshold had to be as high as, you know, this is actual, this does happen. Do we do have, do Eric, Derek Roth and I have the skill to, to uh, you know, structure a screenplay that, you know, that delivered it? So that was the impetus. I, uh, I had so much depth of, of, uh, of preparation on the characters who are in heat, so, uh, which is typical. Uh, I wanted to know for, you know, for working with Bob De Niro, for example, I want to know what, what Neil McCauley was doing when he was 11 in foster care and wearing mismatched clothes that made him ostracized in school at 11 and 12 as he's going through puberty and that makes him angry and hostile. Everything about a character, same thing with uh, Christian Hurlis, the Val Kilmer character, um, you know, and so putting together these imaginary biographies and building them off of fragments of real experiences and real lives, okay? Um, so the, the depth of awareness is so great that, you know, I always wanted to do something else with it. I can never figure out how to uh, explore this world further. And then, uh, then I did figure out how, I think. And so consequently I wrote the book as both a sequel and a prequel, um, a, you know, a kind of oscillating be be between the two. And so that's, that's the origin of the, uh, of the book. And I get nice calls from Warner Brothers saying, is there anything we can do to help? Which, <laughs> which translates as where the hell is the screenplay? So, so I'm in the middle of writing it. So. You're in the middle of writing it. Pardon? Yeah. And one other thing about it is that I don't know. I, have any, I don't know how. Even though I studied English literature. I've no. I don't know how to write a novel. So I didn't approach it as writing a novel. I approached. I do know how to write screenplays. So I approached it as writing a screenplay, meaning um, four acts. I wanted the narrative to have a cinematic engagement and pace to it, and uh, and so. It did the same kind of structure I would for a very, very long screenplay, meaning each act has about 130 scenes in it. And, and um, you know, so that, that's where the structural, you know, that's, what, that's why it's structured kind of the way it is. Silent film it was, it was incredibly advanced because it was silent. In other words, it, so what, what, I, what I liked about Murnau and, and, and some of the other uh, more German expressionist filmmakers was how far they were taking the form. And if, if you uh, see Murnau's Faust, for example, uh, and put yourself in that position, 
uh, you know, that moment in time, it, it, it's, it's a very advanced kinds of narratives. I mean, I go back to Russ, even, you know, back to Eisenstein and different kinds of montage, including intellectual montage and what kind of di dialectic of ideas. And um, it's, to me, it, it stands, the, stands, the, stands the test of time. So film kind of became retrograde in a way when sound came in because of the technical requirements of sound, it became very much like film theater. So, um, you know, and so then cut to 19, you know, 67 or 68, when I'm deciding I want to do film, the whole notion of the films being produced by Hollywood was, uh, was not, I had no ambition to do any of that. I mean, we're going to do Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, you know, and uh, it had no, no appeal to me, what, you know, whatsoever. Um, and, the, you know, I Am Cuba, the Koreans are flying from, you know, the Russian uh, New Wave, which not many people relate to anymore. Uh, from the late 50s, early 60s, that, you know, the French New Wave, um, angry young men in the UK was, was something that, uh, you know, was, was appealing. That's what, that's the kind of, it was the cinema I was interested in. But it was, the, it was the expressionistic quality and the adventurousness of the, um, you know, of the uh, German expressionists particularly that was so appealing. Al didn't do much improvising. He, um, uh, there, was, uh, there was one scene, and I don't remember how much of this was written. Some of it was written and then he embellished on it with uh, Ricky Harris, who was a who tra tragically departed uh, stand-up comedian in the chop shop uh, where I was, I was operating on one of the cameras. I had to walk away because I was cracking up. <laughs> it's, it was, uh, you know, where, uh, so, you know, uh, Harris says, you know, my, you know, my brother's going to meet you. And that's what he's here right now. And he looks under the table. And then he goes <laughs> off singing some song about Philadelphia. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was, there was probably the only scene that, that Al improvised that and another moment where, uh, where we, Al had a, Al's takes, his best takes are always five, six, and seven, or six, seven, and eight. And uh, when we when it was in the can and we had it, he's you know we, we had a shorthand. He said, "Can I do a wild one?" I said, "Sure." That's what that means is Al's going to be completely unplugged. He's going to have no idea what he's going to do, <laughs> and he's and he has tremendous artistic courage. He's not afraid of you know high E on a violin or walking on it. You know. And um, uh, and we just let it rip. And sometimes it was brilliant, and sometimes it was absolutely awful. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he would shrug it, we'd shrug it off and we'd, we'd move on, you know. And there was, there was another scene where that, that happened with, um, with the needle. Yeah, no, and then the scene in Vegas when uh, he slams this guy into a chair and get you know, over large. That's something I observed in language by uh, people who find themselves in, in uh, dire physical situations and they want to communicate something and they don't want to have to repeat it so they will say it very specifically like this. They'll, be, they'll, they'll, they'll emphasize hard consonants and put little gaps so that you get it the first time. And so it, it's, uh, it's a very commanding in a very operational mode, that's where that's where it came from. It's from uh, from me, and and uh, you know, something I observed with uh, John Santucci, with with Charlie Adamson. Charlie Adamson and his partner Dennis Farina, who later became an actor, um, and uh, uh, you know when they described something that happened, or they were talking to somebody, and they wanted that person to listen because they were conveying to them uh, in, in, in usually a pretty forceful way some fact of life. They're, they drop right into that cadence. They didn't want any misunderstanding, and uh, they can be very threatening. And so that's that's really that's really where it came from. Um, I told you Charlie could also uh, he plays the uh, sergeant, and, um, and it's, when Dennis um, we have to experience a thief, he decided he wanted to try acting, and he went to the Goodman Theater and then Remains Theater, which is a theater company in Chicago, run by Billy Peterson. And, um, uh, and then Second City, and it actually became an actor while he was still a detective. He was a very dangerous detective in real life. 
which made for some very interesting confrontations with the actors when we were doing Crime Story, because everybody's tempers got frayed after about 14 or 15 episodes through the season, and somebody would say something off to Dennis, and Dennis would want to give the guy a smack, and he said, you, you, you can't do that. <laughs> So uh, Bill Smitrovich was at the receiving end of one of those it was, uh, one time, anyway. Um, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. We've got to uh, get a, this cinema empty so people can come and enjoy Ferrari, which is amazing. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your questions. Hi, come on, everybody.